Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to say that it's brought to you by Holzkern. More on them later. In 1978, two renowned filmmakers were kidnapped by North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il and forced to make movies for him. This is not just any kidnapping story. This is the gripping tale of how a married filmmaking couple from South Korea were abducted, brainwashed, and turned into propaganda tools for one of the most repressive regimes in the world. In today's episode, we're going to explore the incredible story of Shin Sang-ok and Choi Yun-hee the kidnapped filmmakers behind North Korean cinema. Get ready to experience a story of courage, resilience, and the enduring power of cinema in the face of oppression. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wems here, one of my writers. In this case, Robert has written me a script, The Kidnapped Filmmakers, behind North Korean cinema. As you just learned from the introduction, of course, I've never read this before. Vaguely familiar with this. North Korea gets up to some crazy shit, right? Uh, anyway, uh, let's just jump in, shall we? This is for the war. For the war. On the 14th of January, 1938, South Korean actress Choi on hee was abducted in Hong Kong. The 51-year-old film star and acting school director had arrived in the city a couple of days earlier to meet with a man calling himself Wang Dong-il, who had sent her a script and asked if she would like to direct it. Prior to Choi's arrival, she had called her ex-husband, Shin Sang-ok, a film director himself, to tell him of the news. Shin had been uncertain of the offer, wondering why someone from Hong Kong would go out of their way to seek out Choi as director. Oh, and she was more well known as an actress. Choi brushed off his concerns as jealousy, as Shin's filmmaking career had peaked a long time ago. Yeah, okay, ask someone for their opinion, and then when they give you their opinion, you're like, no. <laughs> Why did you ask then? I hate it when people do that. For two days, Choi explored the city with Wang, though while she enjoyed dining at the city's best restaurants with him, she was frustrated by the lack of business talk. With more concern were two men following her and taking pictures of her, though this was not entirely unexpected due to her fame as an actress. Yeah, so when you're so famous, it's like you don't know whether you're being spied on or whether it's just the paparazzi. Oh, yes, Lady Gaga, paparazzi, yes. Good. Wang introduced Choi to a woman named Lee Sang Hee, and the two quickly became friends. On the 14th, they offered to introduce Choi to a colleague who could manage Choi's film school while she directed. Lee convinced the actress to come with her and her daughter to a house near Repulse Bay on the south side of Hong Kong. The three of them took a taxi to the bay, but as their ride drove past an extremely long stretch of beach, Lee asked the driver to stop and let them out. After the car drove off, Choi asked Lee for an answer for why they'd gotten out, but Lee remained silent. Oh god, when you get out of a car in the middle of nowhere, it just drives off, you're like, oh, this isn't good, is it? This best case, I'm getting kidnapped and made to make films in North Korea. Worst case, just a pop, pop. You know, dead in the forest or wherever, you know. It's never a good time, is what I'm trying to say. Soon, a small white motor skiff appeared on the shore, carrying a group of long-haired men. Lee assured Choi that these men were there to take Choi across the bay to her friend's villa, but Choi hesitated. Before she could deny Lee's request, the men grabbed her and threw her into the boat, driving off into the sea. Oh god, here we go. Two weeks later, Choi's ex-husband, Shin Sang-ok, became increasingly worried about her, having not heard from her since her trip. His Chinese representative in the city, Lee young Seng, encouraged Shin to fly to Hong Kong. Once there, however, Shin was unable to gather any hard evidence as to her whereabouts. Shin spent the next few weeks in the United States working on business deals. The news about Choi's disappearance hit the Korean newspapers while he was in California. A reporter managed to flood Shin with questions, even telling him people accused him of being behind his ex-wife's disappearance. When Shin arrived back in Hong Kong on February the 28th, reporters and police detectives were waiting for him at the gate. It's always the husband, except it's not in this case, it's Kim Jong-il! So what exactly happened that night? After Troy was kidnapped, she asked one of her abductors where they were going. When he gave her an answer, she was in such shock that she needed him to repeat himself. I said, we're going to the bosom of the great leader, Comrade General Kim Il-sung. She's like, oh no, I'm being kidnapped by a government. This is much worse than a regular kidnapping. What can be worse than death? Upon hearing the name of the leader of North Korea, Choi screamed, jumping to her feet. She was quickly restrained and pinned down. She was drugged and then drifted off to sleep. After six days on the boat, they arrived. <laughs> Good lord, that's a long journey. <laughs> After six days on the boat, they arrived at Nampo Harbor in North Korea. The men led her on to a pier. Choi's legs wobbled, barely able to walk. A short man in his mid 30s approached, wearing a thick, fashionable wool coat over his uniform. A shiny Mercedes was on the road behind him, and a photographer stood at the man's side, his camera ready. The man extended his hand to her. Thank you for coming, Madame Choi. You must be exhausted from the journey. Welcome. I am Kim Jong-il. 
Oh my, you must be exhausted from the journey. It's like, nah, I was asleep for most of it because you drugged me. When Shin met Choi. Shin Sang Ok and Choi Eun Hee were both born in Korea in the fall of 1926. When the two had met, Choi had already lived a life full of hardship. After running away from home at the age of 17, she met an actress she liked during, of all places, an air raid drill. The two became friends, and within a month, the actress had gotten her part in a play. At age 21, Choi was cast in her first film. Shortly thereafter, she married the film's cameraman, who was 20 years her senior. She quickly regretted this decision, as her new husband turned out to be abusive. He simultaneously expected her to fulfill her duties as a housewife while also expecting her to provide for them. As her career as an actress always picking up steam. <laughs> yeah, right, dude. How's that gonna work out for you? <laughs> you're lazy and you're stupid. So, just let me interrupt today's video to tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, and that is Holskern, who are currently celebrating their seventh birthday. Holskern is a company that's been creating natural and unique accessories since 2015. The watch that I have on right now pop this off it's one of my favorites it's beautiful it's got this natural grain wood in the bracelet right there and that means every piece is unique because obviously wood is organic it's unique and then there's this blue steel around it it's automatic and uh, it's got this like skeletonized back so you can see through and see all the movements and everything which looks fantastic holes can have a variety of watches and jewelry for both men and women and they even have new additions like sunglasses and handbags what makes holescon truly special is their philosophy they believe that accessories are not just accessories but they're personal pieces of nature that remind you to spend your time consciously be proud to be unique and to have an emotional connection with nature and the best part is that holescon give back to nature by supporting reforestation projects and other environmental protection and social support initiatives so when you buy a product from them you're not just getting a beautiful piece of nature you're also contributing to a better future for our planet so that's nice to celebrate their seventh birthday holescon is offering a 15 percent discount on all products until the end of march just visit world.holescon.com forward slash en underscore world forward slash the casual criminalist and because that's a nightmare there's a link below and just use the code casual 15 plus they're throwing in a polishing cloth worth 15 euros and don't forget free shipping to most eu countries and to the us within two to five days and there's a 24 month warranty and a 24 day rider return so celebrate holescon's seventh birthday there's a link below and now back to today's video when the korean war broke out in 1950 Choi and her husband were not able to escape seoul before it was captured by the north she was assigned as an entertainer for the northern troops a year later she escaped and was taken in by the south where she resumed working as an entertainer for the other side unfortunately the south was not much better and one day she was raped by a military officer after the war Choi returned home with her husband who had suffered crippling injuries during the war rumors had spread that Choi had been a sex worker during those years angering her husband even though there was no evidence to support this her husband's abuse both physical and sexual continued a few months after the war ended Choi met shin san oak shin had not suffered as Choi had growing up affluent and oh, working a job painting posters during world war ii both propaganda posters for troops as well as film posters for the few cinemas that were still open during the korean war shin made a name for himself making documentary films Choi and shin began an affair and before long word got back to her husband as well as the press word spread of the actress abandoning her crippled husband to have an affair with the young film director but to the young couple it didn't matter she divorced her husband and had an informal wedding with shin the very same day the first three years of their marriage shin and Choi made four films together their fourth movie a flower in hell starred Choi as a yang win girl the sex worker who catered to american soldiers the film was a massive success launching their careers to great heights in 1959 he directed six films each starring Choi, and each one became a box office hit oh my six films in one year how often did don't directors typically do like one or two movies maybe a year especially for them like if you're if you're like a big director directing box office hits like how many movies a year does steven spielberg do i feel like it's one movie every five years or something in 1960 shin directed the tale of chung yang an adaptation of a korean folk tale a separate adaptation was also being made by another director and the two films were released just 10 days apart with shin's coming second this is like surprisingly common there's this thing uh, called the twin film phenomena and it's where uh, the the classic example is always armageddon and deep impact which i think both came out in 1998 1999 something like that and it's a, they're both movies about an asteroid coming to destroy the world and they're both released the same summer and it's like how is that possible are they copying each other and it's very rarely that they're copying each other because they both lose if that happens typically there's been something in the news that someone has seen and then they've been like cool i'm gonna write a script about that 
and then the script gets picked up and there's someone else out there who read that same thing in the news also thought the same process and those two films end development at the same time so it's usually some inciting event at some time in the past that has led to that point and i just found this fascinating because i just assumed they were copying each other for the longest time it's also you see it on youtube sometimes like i'll release a video and then the next day uh, a channel will release another channel that isn't mine will release a video on exactly the same topic and i'd be like why are you so obsessed with me or the other way around so people are like, oh, simon you copied that guy i'm like bro one it takes me more than 24 hours to make a video and two i i didn't it's just we probably saw the same news article and thought oh i'm gonna make a video about that and they happened to you know the production process took a similar amount of time it's just how it is it would be his highest budget movie yet and yet a flop that could bankrupt the company the stakes were so high that shin's office was broken into and one of his staff members was kidnapped in what some speculate to be an attempt by his rival to delay the release of the movie oh my god as it turns out shin's bet paid off not only did it vastly outperform his competition at the box office but the movie was so popular that it was seen by 15 percent of seoul's entire population wow that's a lot of money how clean before long, his company was producing hit after hit with his film The House Guest and My Mother winning the award for Best Picture at the 1962 Asia Pacific Film Festival. South Korea's new president, General Park Chung-hee, attended the festival to congratulate him. As for Choi, the rumors about her being a sex worker during the Korean War were all but forgotten. Shin's company, Shin Film, continued to grow, making 30 films a year at its peak. This guy is prolific, although that's his company. So this would be like, I don't know how many movies Paramount makes a year. But that can be done at scale because you have different directors and stuff. Choi even directed three films of her own, all of which were critical and commercial successes. She also started a film school educating fellow actors. At the height of her popularity, she was even photographed with American actress Marilyn Monroe. Can you believe? Unfortunately, when it came time to start a family, Choi found that she was unable to conceive, though it is unclear whether this was genetic or due to her prior sexual abuse. In 1971, the two of them adopted a baby girl, followed by a boy three years later shin film continued to grow and with it shin's ego yeah dude he is so sick he's got a ridiculous amount of success both financial in his career um and also creative so i don't know his career is creative but you could see why this would inflate his ego jesus the company would fluctuate between having tons of cash on hand and being on the brink of bankruptcy as shin bet on new projects his influence extended beyond the film industry into politics as he could get a project past the censors with a simple phone call multiple times shin was arrested and found guilty of tax evasion though he was still allowed to release his films despite being found guilty of fraud <laughs> dude just pay your bills come on in i-74 troy read a magazine headline that filled his heart with dread it turned out to be shin's son husband had been having an affair with oh su mi a 25 year old actress who had starred in his new movie farewell ironically the movie was about a man torn between his wife and another young woman played by oh now the actress had given birth to his son Choi fell into a deep depression kicking Shin out of the house and confronting Oh herself stopping short when she saw the woman's newborn baby to make matters worse Shin decided to remake Chun Hee a film Choi had starred in 16 years earlier but with Oh Su Mi in the starring role bro that is not <laughs> that is the dickiest of dick moves this guy sounds like he's super successful in all this stuff but he also sounds like a bit of a dick doesn't he you <laughs> He's got dick vibes, and now we know he is a dick. God, the audacity. The public grew tired of Shin, both for his cheating and for his frequent tax evasion schemes. His funding dried up, his political allies refused to bend the rules for him, and finally, the Office of Public Ethics stripped Shin film of its production license after he failed to remove a topless scene prior to a film screening. In 1976, Osumi had a second child with Shin, a girl. Whatever hope Choi had of repairing their marriage was gone. After 22 years, she asked for a divorce. Whoa, patient much. He's like, nah, I'm having an affair with this other woman. I'm making a movie with her starring in the role that you used to have. Also, we've got two kids together. And she's like, I guess it's now time to get divorced. I know the past was different, but, uh, and also this is a different culture that I'm not super familiar with, but that, that seems very patient. Take your time, sleep on it, then get back to me. Or else. For the next two years, Choi fell into despair, even attempting suicide. She did not act in another film, and what strength she had was spent trying to save her film school from going bankrupt. With Choi in emotional peril and Shin stripped of his production license, their lives, as they knew them, were over. That is, until they would be reunited under the strangest of circumstances. The Disaster Artist.
On February the 16th, 1941, a boy named Yurei Ilsenovich Kim was born in a Soviet army camp near Khabarovsk, a town in eastern Russia. Growing up, the boy known as Yura throughout his childhood became a huge fan of movies. At the age of seven, he attended a preview of a movie called My Home Village and made a point to tell the filmmakers ways in which he thought the movie could be improved, showing he had a critic's eye at a young age. <laughs> When he's seven years old, it's like, I think you could do your movie slightly better. And be like, shut up, kids. I hate kids. A few months after viewing the final version of the movie, Yura's mother passed away. Yura was much closer to his mother than his father, who was absent for a large portion of his childhood, and his mother's death affected him greatly. But when Nikita Khrushchev took over as leader of Russia, Yura's father pressured him to change his name, feeling his Russian name would be an embarrassment. Taking part of his name from his mother, Kim Jong-suk, and his father, Kim Il-sung, the young man became known as Kim Jong-il. Oh my god, is this is Kim Jong-il's origin story? <laughs> I'm sure I made a video about him on my uh, on the on the Biographics channel, but I don't remember this origin story for Kim Jong Il. When Kim Il Sung made an effort to engage his son in politics, Jong Il showed little interest, preferring to immerse himself in film. He quickly exhausted the catalog of movies available in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, also known as North Korea. <laughs> oh, it's called Democratic. And as the leader's son, he was also able to smuggle in bootleg movies that the country's average citizen would not have access to. Eventually, his interest in filmmaking became a positive for his father. At age 25, he was assigned the role of cultural arts director of the propaganda and agitation department. <laughs> agitation department sounds so 1984, even for, uh, 1984, even for North Korea, where he would be in charge of making films for his country. He worked on a movie called Sea of Blood, based on an opera allegedly written by Kim Il-sung about a 1930s Manchurian family standing up to Japanese oppression. The movie was directed by Cho Gyu, the only other person in the country who shared Kim's knowledge of film. The movie was a huge success in North Korea and turned Kim from the secretive son of the country's leader to a household name. <laughs> How good is that movie, though? It's like, who's it made by? The son of the leader of a massively oppressive regime. My feeling is, even if that movie was absolute shite, that movie could be just absolute garbage, and people would be like, I love it, and it's the best movie ever, and it's playing in all the movie theaters all the time, and it's the most successful, and don't forget, it was written by his dad. <laughs> During this time, Kim fell in love with one of the actresses and before long had a boy they named Kim Jong-nam. Jong-nam was, according to his aunt, the biggest secret in North Korea. In fact, even Kim Jong-il's father was kept in the dark as long as possible. At least, due to Kim's secretive lifestyle, he was able to spend a lot of time with his son, though it was hardly an ideal agreement. He spoiled his child, buying him a Cadillac and imported guns. <laughs> Okay. Uh, when the boy wanted to see a North Korean comedian perform live, Jong Il tried to have him abducted. When that failed, he hired a lookalike to perform instead, but his son recognized that it was an imposter and threw a tantrum. The fate of the imposter is unknown. Oh my god. Also, this is how you ruin children. It was an unusual arrangement for everyone involved, as Jong Nam and his mother, as well as her two older children uh, from a former marriage, were essentially locked in a luxury prison for two decades. The dancer who had performed for Kim Il Sung had once publicly spoken of Jong Il's secret family. As punishment, the dancer and her family were thrown in a prison camp. After 10 years, she was the only survivor. Oh my god, f North Korea, right? There's no shopping in North Korea. The people around Kim Jong il saw multiple sides of him. On the one hand, he was very intelligent and cultured, very witty, even willing to make jokes at his own expense. However, he was prone to becoming very angry and violent when he didn't get his way. <laughs> this, this is the worst when you're so scary. He's like, oh, you know me with my silly hair? And then one of his like cronies will be like, yeah, Kim, you have the silliest hair. And then Kim will be like, execute him. <laughs> it's like classic dictator piece of shit move. In 1972, Kim released The Flower Girl, the tale of a young woman who sold flowers during Japanese occupation. After suffering through most of the film, she's rescued by Kim Il-sung's army. The film may have been blatant propaganda, but it was a success, not just in North Korea, but internationally, even winning an award at a film festival in Czechoslovakia, the first international prize for any North Korean film. Wow, so maybe these were actually good movies, rather than like, you will love the movie! Um, or will execute you with a Gatling gun. Kim's success as a filmmaker and propagandist caught the attention of his father, Kim Il-sung, who began preparing his son to succeed him. But it wasn't just recognition in North Korea that Kim Jong-il craved. He wanted to be known throughout the world and felt his films would be the best way to accomplish that. So he hatched a plan to bring who he considered to be the best filmmakers in the world to his doorstep. In winter of 1978, he did just that, kidnapping Choi Yun-hee and greeting her upon arrival in North Korea. 
Choi was only vaguely aware of who Kim Jong-il was, reluctantly reaching her hand out to shake his as a photographer took photos. Instinctively, she yelled at the photographer, not wanting a record of that moment, as well as not being used to have pictures taken uh, when she wasn't made up. They got in the car and drove off. On the way to Pyongyang, the capital, Kim tried to make small talk with Choi as if the two of them were having a pleasant conversation. <laughs> just kidnapped her and took her on a six-day boat trip after being drugged god damn Troy would later recall that there were no signs of people and the scenery had the desolation of a war zone she was driven to her grand villa whose decorated interior sharply contrasted with the world outside she was made to give over her south korean passport and id cards to kim jong-il after dinner in which she was only feeling well enough to have soup she was shown her bedroom which she discovered did not have a lock the villa was to be her new home over the next several months, Troy became accustomed to her new life. She was regularly sent gifts by Kim Jong-il, attended numerous dinner parties, and was taught North Korean etiquette. She observed Kim as someone who made great effort to make sure his parties ran smoothly, yet also noted that whatever he said quickly became law, no matter whether it was said sober or while drunk at three in the morning. <laughs> I think that everybody should have my hair cut. Everybody. Everybody says, I love my hair. And then he did, and all the bull people were executed. <laughs> his parties presented a contradiction to some citizens, as they were meant to be kept private from his father. The details of one of these parties reached a concerned citizen, feeling they were counter to North Korean values. She wrote a letter to Kim Il-sung detailing the events in question. When John Il heard of the letter, he had the woman arrested and brought to one of his parties, where he demanded that the woman be shot. The woman's husband begged John Il to let him do the shooting, and John Il granted his request oh my lord again f north korea am i right you are right sir you are right however troy witnessed none of these events rather she experienced comparatively light-hearted affairs such as a game where kim would randomly shout army uniforms prompting all the men to put on a uniform under the seat and run around the table in circles until he told them to stop nearly every it's like sounds half fun and half absolutely terrifying nearly every week he would ask troy to sing a song which she would do knowing that she didn't have a choice evidently kim liked troy so much that he had her attend his birthday party with his son kim jong nam and the boy's mother naturally troy couldn't help but feel resentful that she had been taken away from her own family <laughs> you're like this is brilliant kim i'm having a brilliant time and inside she's like I only do this because you keep shooting people around me. <laughs> Kim made sure to have Troy educated on North Korean culture, showing her parts of Pyongyang, the nation's films, and giving her lessons on the country's history. She was forced to read a three-volume biography of Kim Il-sung aloud with her assigned instructor, forcing her to memorize passages word for word. In particular, Troy had a great deal of trouble with understanding the country's communist philosophy. Oh, when they explained why their way of life was better than the South, she argued with the instructors as she had grown up in the South, knowing for a fact that her arguments were lies. When called out, her instructors would become angry with her, failing to give her an adequate explanation. At the very least, Kim Jong-il himself seemed to hold her opinion in high regard. Oh, when she made suggestions about North Korean films that she had been shown, he took her advice to heart. When she suggested that some of the films could be improved with a love interest, he thought about it for a moment before shrugging. When director Shin gets here, oh, we can figure it out. <laughs> when he gets here. Ah, you can never give as well. Taken. After Choi's disappearance, Shing Sang Ok was thoroughly interrogated by Hong Kong police officers. His family was in chaos as he and Choi's children had no idea where their mother was. During the investigation, the script for one of Shin's films was found in the apartments of Lee Sang Hee, the woman who was with Choi the night she had been kidnapped. When Kim Kyu Hua, Shin's manager, was questioned about the script, he confessed that Lee had paid him to invite Choi to Hong Kong on behalf of a small company nobody in the room had heard of. Kyu Hua was promptly arrested and sent back to Seoul, where he would eventually be given a 15-year prison sentence for conspiring with North Koreans. I was like, but did he even know they were North Koreans? It was just an unknown company. Oh God, that's savage. As for Shin, his financial problems were coming to a head. With his wife's disappearance and his South Korean film license revoked, he had trouble getting a passport so he could work overseas. The director of his Hong Kong office, Lee Yong Seng, told Shin that he could get him a Central American passport. Desperate and low on funds, Shin agreed. Why does he need money to get a passport? I mean, I know you have to pay, like, a fee to get a passport, but, I don't know, isn't it like a hundred quid or something? It's not expensive. And can the country be like, you can't have a passport because you're poor? <laughs> that doesn't sound okay. 
And why is he getting a Central American one instead? What's going on? The beaches are beautiful. This all sounds like it's leading up to him getting kidnapped, which it is. The two of them took a ferry to Hong Kong Island where they met with Lee's contact. They were driven to a remote location on the island where four men stood in the road. They walked over to Shin's door and dragged him out. One held a knife to his throat while other slipped a nylon bag over his head before drugging him. When he woke up, he was on a boat. <laughs> He's like, are we going to get the passport or what? <laughs> The man that Shin had worked for for years had been a North Korean all along. Holy sh**. He wasn't your friend after all, was he? <laughs> like Choi, Shin was taken to a villa in Pyongyang, though he did not meet with Kim Jong-il like she had. For the next two months, he was given a tour of the city and educated on North Korean culture and ethics. At this point, he's probably like, man, at least I get somewhere free to live because I was broke ass in South Korea. On September the 9th, 1978, he was shown the mass games, an event celebrating the founding of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Shin was able to see Kim Il-sung and the Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping, in the VIP section. Little did he know, Choi was also in the audience that day. Choi was able to make friends in a new environment. Some of them were born and raised under Kim Il-sung, worshipping him as a god, but she was still able to maintain a level of respect with them. Others were kidnapped as she was, and they would exchange stories of their abductions in the few moments that they had out of earshot of others. Oh, while Choi had mostly accepted her new life, Shin was intent on getting out. Wait, so both of these guys' lives was kind of messed up, mostly by Shin. Um, almost entirely by Shin. Choi seemed like to be pretty good all throughout her life. And she just got screwed over by two men and then kidnapped. So Choi's got it really rough. Shin's also kind of a dick, so I have a lot less sympathy for Shin. <laughs> and he's like, I want to escape and get back to my broke-ass life in South Korea. Is <laughs> and Choi's like, nah, I kind of accept it. I'm here. Shin, you're such a dickhead. Thank you, Simon. In, he patiently observed his surroundings and potential escape routes. He had noticed a Mercedes-Benz often parked outside of his villa, which was never locked and rarely checked on. What, where are you going to drive to? You've been kidnapped by a nation state. <laughs> You're going to get to the border and be like, nice Mercedes. <laughs> Where'd you get that? Where are you going? After all, few people in the country owned cars, let alone knew how to drive on, and there was nobody to sell the car to. He managed to convince a deputy director to loan him a map under the guise that he was having trouble memorizing the names of the battlefields where Kim Il-sung fought. Finally, on a freezing cold night in late December, he made a break for it. When the coast was clear, he stole the car and hit the gas, hoping to make it to the American embassy in China. Dude, how far away is that? It's in a different country that's massive. Halfway through the route, he swerved to avoid a farmer on the road, accidentally crashing his car into a ditch. It took him half an hour to get the car out, but he was determined to escape. When he arrived at a military guard post, he realized that he couldn't bluff his way past the guards with his car in the condition it was and just blew straight through it. The car was also not built for the gravel roads outside the city, and one of its tires blew out. When he made it to railroad tracks, he ditched the car and ran, ignoring the cries of nearby soldiers. He managed to board an empty freight car, and then finally relaxed as the train took off. Little did he know he'd been spotted when he got on the train and he was caught less than 10 miles from the Chinese border. Oh, I thought it was going to be like, little did he know, but that train went straight back to Pyongyang. When he was detained, he was interrogated by his captors, who seemed astounded that he had wanted to leave the country, considering that he had been treated as well as the country's elite class. That should really tell you something about how preferable it is to live anywhere he was broke and had a failing career in south korea and he's treated as a king in north korea and he's still like nah i just want to escape and go back to my, my shitty life in south korea please that should really tell you something soldier about the country that you live in they would frequently leave the room leaving shin to believe they were relaying their messages to kim jong-il himself eventually shin was hauled off to north korean prison camp in prison shin was given strict rules to follow he was not allowed to sleep unless instructed he must sit up he was not allowed to move his head or his hands unless given permission the food he was given was unsanitary and full of stones. During his prison sentence, one of his toes became infected, as it had been frostbitten during his escape attempt. And yet, the guards treated him well compared to the other prisoners yet there. What's happening to the other prisoners? He's eating stones. A pinch of salt in there. And he's not allowed to sleep. It's, he's being tortured. They were curious about his time in South Korea, not believing him when he said anyone in the country could buy chocolate. He was told the soap he had used while at the villa made him smell like a capitalist. Shin believed that he would die in the cell, even scratching his name in the wall with the spoon that they gave him for his meals. After two weeks, he was given a kind of parole hearing where he repented for his sins and praised his beloved leader, comrade Kim Jong-il. Oh my god, yeah, all of the shit I talk. If I was in North Korean prison camp, I'd be like, I've changed my mind. Kim Jong-il is the best. There is no one who is better. I love him. I love his ways. Everything, please let me go. Over the next few months, he had more hearings and his treatment steadily improved, being given eggs to eat and multivitamins for his health. 
A rare treat for prisoners. Ah, yes. <laughs> a rare treat of multivitamins. I can't complain and won't. Finally, he was taken to an office and given a military crew cart where the deputy director explained that he was being released from prison. He was taken to a new house where he resumed his life of watching North Korean movies and memorizing propaganda, but Shin was still determined to escape. He noticed a hidden panel in the wall of one of the rooms behind a radiator. Months after his return to the house, he made his second escape attempt. This time he planned to hide within the panel, hoping the guards would desert the property once they discovered that he was missing. To his dismay, they hung around, and after three days, an attendant discovered Shin's hiding place while cleaning the room. Housekeeping. Barbed wire was installed outside the windows of the house, and weeks later, Shin would, ta would be taken to prison number six, where he thought he would be killed. Similar to the previous prison he had been in, he was forced to sit still for hours on end, only being allowed to move for ten minutes a day. Oh my god, that's brutal. Prisoners' legs were often swollen from sitting in the same position for so long, as the official explanation went, a prisoner would not be continually able to ponder his guilt if he were allowed to sleep. That is up North Korea. This was called the torture position, and it would be Shin's daily regimen for the next two years. Ah, oh. My ass hurts just watching this. During this time, South Korean President Park Chung-hee was assassinated by his own security chief. Whoa! Whoa, I didn't know that part of history. That's wild. While Choi had not been close to him, she was still shocked to hear that the man who stood with her and her husband when their movie was given an award had been killed. During her time in the North, she had little knowledge of what was going on back home, but Park's death was too large to be kept secret from her. During Shin's time in prison, he kept his sanity by going over his prior movies in his head, mentally rewriting and reshooting them. Back home, he had been proud of his films, partly due to the wealth they had brought him, but on reflection, he found them to be shallow. And embarrassing. On occasion, he was asked to write a letter to Kim Jong il in which he would uh, repent for his sins against the country. Shin realized that he likely would have been killed for his uh, repeated escape attempts and decided to write about ways that he could improve the North Korean movies that he had seen and how they could be used to educate the country. While in prison, Shin was surprised to find that another prisoner recognized him. In the fleeting moments that they were able to talk, Shin was told that Choi had been kidnapped as well. After a five-day hunger strike in which he passed out, Shin's treatment by prison guards improved. Sometimes he would be interviewed and questioned about the movies he had made, questions so specific that they must have come from Kim Jong-il directly. Finally, on February the 23rd, 1983, after years in prison, Shin was released. He was given new clothes, a haircut, and a medical checkup. Ten days later, he was taken to one of Kim Jong-il's parties. When he arrived, he met the beloved leader for the first time. He also saw Choi Yun-hee for the first time in five years. Choi and Shin stared at each other in shock until they were finally reintroduced to each other by a jubilant Kim Jong-il. You'd just be like, he's just kept me in the torture prison for like five years or whatever. And you're just like, yeah, I'm having a great time at the party, Kim. This is a great party. <laughs> Oh my god, this is horrible. Well, go ahead and hug each other, he said. <laughs> they awkwardly went along with his suggestion, and he placed the two of them at his sides, making them pose for pictures. Relax, this won't end up in the South Korean papers. It was an odd moment of self-awareness for the leader of a, dicta of a dictatorship. Once upon a time in Pyongyang. That night... Shin and Choi were taken back to the villa that Choi had stayed at when she first arrived. When they were finally left alone, they weren't sure what to make of each other. Both of them were worried that the other had been brainwashed, but as it turned out, Choi's acting abilities had come in handy after her kidnapping. Shin had broken her heart years earlier, but at this moment, there was nobody else in the world that he wanted to be with. They were given a degree of freedom to explore the country, although they were still watching four movies a day, including films from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. They only met with Kim Jong-il on occasion, either attending one of his parties or a film event. After being shown their new offices, Kim held a private meeting with them on October the 19th, 1983. Little did Kim know that Choi had snuck a tape recorder into her purse and had practiced how to discreetly turn it on and off. Like preparing for a film, Shin and Choi practiced their lines before meeting with Kim. They wound up recording 45 minutes of audio of the meeting, in which Kim Jong-il laid out his reasons for kidnapping them and his plans for them for the future. Kim complained about how we don't have any films that get into film festivals, hoping the two of them would be able to fix the problem for him. He apologized to Shin for how he had been treated, claiming that there had been a lot of misunderstandings. <laughs> it's like, bro, you put me in the torture prison for five years, dude. How many murderous dictators have talked that kind of rubbish? While the entire conversation cannot be recorded, the CIA and KCIA have since been able to verify the recording's authenticity. What is the KCIA? I've never heard of the KCIA. Is this like some sort of other version of the CIA that's even more terrifying? Oh, 
the National Intelligence Service of South Korea. The KCIA. It's really called the Korean Central Intelligence Service. I guess that should have been obvious, but I thought it was too obvious. Because wouldn't it be called something in Korean? It's a Korean thing. Kim wanted North Korean films to be known on a world stage. To do that, however, he would need to present Shin and Choi to the world. They needed to tell the world that they came to North Korea willingly. Kim wanted to be known as the man who restored Shin sang Ok's reputation after his license had been revoked in the South. The couple would be granted $2 million a year to use however they wanted. Oh my lord, that is a lot of money. That's probably even more money in North Korea, and it's definitely even more money in like the 1980s or whenever this was happening. Yeah, 1980s? Damn. Though they would be under strict supervision any time they left the country, they were given new passports and set out to the task of filming their first movie in years. At the very least, Shin's wish to make films again was finally granted. They decided not to rock the boat for their first movie, An Emissary of No Return. The movie was based on the 1907 Hague Peace Conference, itself a precursor to the Geneva Protocol meetings in 1925. While based on a true event, Shin decided to portray the conference in the way North Korea taught it, in which a North Korean emissary forced his way into the hall, gave an passion speech and committed Hari Kiri a ritual suicide when he failed to sway imperial powers. In real life, the man had simply died of an illness. When Shin and Choi traveled to East Berlin for location scouting, uh, they were shadowed every step of the way by North Korean guards who were with them every waking hour. Their passports were only to be used when crossing the border and confiscated the rest of the time. Shin did manage to contact one of his old friends, a Japanese film critic, by letting his handler listen to the call. Shin hoped his old friend would be able to read between the lines. A few days later, filming began on the movie at the Barrandov Studios lot in Prague, Czechoslovakia. That's like 10 minutes drive from here. <laughs> It was a bizarre affair, as Shin was under close scrutiny by his North Korean handlers, yet simultaneously was giving orders himself. Korean and Czech staff members used broken English to communicate, as neither were fluent in the other's language. Choi would not be acting in this movie, merely working as co-director. Shin clashed with Choi ik Gyu, the former director of North Korean film studios, who was frustrated his job was handed over to a capitalist. When Cho criticized Shin's choice of camera angles, Shin angrily called him out, saying that if he wanted to take over production, then he could but it would be going against Kim Jong-il's orders. Cho backed off. <laughs> yeah, no surprise. When filming in Prague concluded, they returned back to North Korea. Kim Jong-il was thrilled when the watchdogs reported that the couple had behaved while well out of the country and began making plans to open a film studio in Eastern Europe. He sent Shin and Choi to Budapest in Hungary to scout a suitable location. In Budapest, Shin had quietly managed to arrange a meeting with his Japanese friend, to whom he handed over the tape recording, letters to their family, and the photo taken of Choi when she first met Kim Jong-il. If Shin and Choi were not seen again, his colleague was to make everything public. They wouldn't be able to escape, but they could at least covertly contact the outside world. They managed to finish an emissary of no return ahead of schedule, and Kim Jong-il was so proud of the final product that he hosted a special preview at party headquarters. The movie oh, is a hit, and a first for North Korean cinema as it used foreign footage and, more importantly, had a credit roll at the end. As they prepared the movie for wide release, Shin's Japanese colleague had decided to go to the news with the media that he had been given. News stations reported their kidnapping and their forced film for North Korea, infuriating Shin and Choi's handlers. Kim Jong-il seemed surprisingly calm about the whole ordeal, asking them to hold a press conference and tell the world that they had defected willingly. Knowing that the only way they'd ever be able to escape was to convince the outside world of their defection, they agreed. Next morning, Shin flew to Belgrade in Serbia to hold a Paris press conference. He gave a prepared statement, telling the press that he and his ex-wife had been in West Germany, where one of Kim Jong-il's envoys had approached them with a funding proposal. When asked about the interviews he gave years ago, where he openly wondered if Troy had been kidnapped, he failed to give a concrete answer. He knew he was telling the reporters nonsense. He'd be like, yeah, I don't know why I said that. Don't know why. I read between the lines. <laughs> When An Emissary of No Return was released to the general public in North Korea, it was a gigantic hit. For those born after the country's division in 1945, it showed them their first glimpse of what the world outside their country looked like. The film was propaganda, and screenings were compulsory, but the main character's suicide in the film's climax moved audiences to tears. Kim Jong-il submitted the film to the Carlo Vivari Film Festival in Czechoslovakia, where it won the award for Best Director. A film that bins that film festival. Two times? Three times? It's enjoyable. Confusingly, it was given to Choi, given that the credits read Director Choi Yun Hee under the general direction of Shin Sang Ok. An award was an award, though, nonetheless. More importantly, it seemed that the excitement over the film had made Kim Jong il forget about the reports of their kidnapping. Shin and Choi were finally beginning to earn his trust. The film was then accepted at the London Film Festival. Shin and Choi attended, but their bodyguards kept an even closer arm than them before. In communist countries, they had been allowed a degree of freedom. 
but not here. The trip was brief and seemed more like a North Korean publicity stunt than anything else. At the very least, the trip went well, and Kim allowed Shin to set up a bank account in Vienna, the capital of Austria, as well as to scout an office location there for Shin Film. They got to work on their next movies. Their second film, Runaway, was another nationalist drama, but Shin greatly enjoyed the final product, particularly because he was granted a level of freedom with it that he didn't have back in the South. When they needed a large fan to simulate wind, Kim sent them a helicopter. When they needed fake snow while shooting during the spring, Kim opted to fly the crew out to Mount Peikdu, where it was still snowing. The country's military was on hand when a scene needed thousands of extras. Best of all, when Shin wanted to have an exciting climax to top off the film, Kim sent him a functioning train packed with explosives. I gotta say, like, I get he was so keen to escape, but wasn't he kind of all, uh, yeah, you're making propaganda and stuff. But in terms of like unlimited budget and freedom, and obviously working for an oppressive regime is not great, but it's better than being in the torture prison, isn't it? Like just getting unlimited money, basically, to make movies with. That's better than torture prison. I would totally sell out and make the propaganda movies. Am I insane? You keep thinking it's about money, but it's about fear. After Runaway came a romance movie, Love, Love, My Love, which featured musical scores and the country's first on-screen kiss. While fairly tame by today's standards to the sexually repressed North Koreans, it may as well have been Fifty Shades of Grey. Their fourth movie, Salt, was another international sensation. In the movie, Choi played a mother who disapproved of her son's decision to join a guerrilla force, ultimately coming over to his side when she realized he was fighting a just cause. It was an emotionally intense movie that even included a graphic rape scene, but in this case, Kim Il-sung commended Shin for his commitment to realism. Choi's performance was so powerful that she was awarded Best Actress at the Moscow Film Festival. Following Salt, O was a fantasy movie, the tale of Shim Chong, as well as Hong Kyo Dong, a martial arts film. Every movie they put out was a smash hit, with Shin and Joy becoming just as well known throughout the country as Kim Il sung himself. Movie theaters were packed, citizens would sing the songs made famous from the films, and the lead actor of Love, Love, My Love was a heartthrob popular with teenage girls. Dreamy, isn't he? Each success allowed them more and more freedom to where they even met and shook hands with Kim Il sung himself. Finally, Shin directed what would ultimately be the most famous movie ever made by North Korea. The Godzilla franchise had been hugely successful in Japan, and after the return of Godzilla was translated into Korean, Kim Jong-il decided he wanted a monster movie of his own. The result was Pulgasari, and it was by far the worst movie Shin made in those years. The movie, set in medieval times, revolves around farmers oppressed by a dictatorial regime. When a young woman pricks her finger, a drop of blood falls onto a dragon figurine her father had made, causing the dragon to spring to life. The dragon begins eating metal, growing in both size and strength, eventually becoming strong enough to defeat the oppressive regime. However, However, Pulgasari continues to hunger, eventually turning on the woman's village. In the end, he is defeated through some magic that I'm not even going to attempt to explain here. Yeah, this film sounds, uh, it sounds bad. Now, I've actually seen Pulgasari. Really? I love movies like that. I yeah, know. great. And if I may turn this into the casual movie critic for a moment, it's actually not as terrible as you might expect. Okay. While by no means a good movie, it was competently shot and the set designs looked good for the time period that they were portraying. The main issues are the incoherent story and the lousy effects made worse by the fact that Kim Jong-il flew in some Japanese crew who had worked on the Godzilla movies who were told they were working on a film in China. When they arrived in Pyongyang, their passports were taken away for safety. Oh my god. The most baffling element of Pulgasari is that the monster was supposed to be a metaphor for capitalism. In the film's climax, the protagonist cries that you, our savior, would become our enemy. When the country's iron is gone, the people will have to take you and invade other countries. The implication being that capitalism is unsustainable. Of course, another interpretation of the film is that Pulgasari represents Kim Il sung himself. Yes, that seems like the much more obvious interpretation of the movie, isn't it? As he united the country against their southern neighbors, only for him to turn on and exploit his own countrymen after the war's conclusion. Yet yeah, the d <laughs> That's what it's about, no? I rate the film two stars out of five. Not a bad pick for a movie night with friends. Despite Paul Gasari being a mess of a movie, it wound up being Shin's biggest hit in the country. Defectors would even say they witnessed crowds crushing people to death as they went to the cinema. Yeah, I mean, this, this is like, popular movies are not necessarily good movies. Uh, case in point, the Fast and the Furious franchise. Winning's winning. Kim Jong Il was thrilled with the result, giving a gigantic amount of gifts to the studio, who then threw a big party for themselves. Not only was he planning on distributing the movie worldwide, but he also hoped its success would save North Korea from bankruptcy. Dude, if your country's GDP or whatever is relying on the film industry to support itself, 
That's not a good sign, dude. He hoped the film would draw the attention of studios in Vienna as his next project was to be based on the famous conqueror Genghis Khan. The country's movie industry showed no signs of slowing down. Shill and Troy, yeah, but they're just you're just relying on these two people. What if one of them dies? <laughs> Oh my. Shin and Choi were to attend the Berlin Film Festival before traveling to Vienna to set up a studio branch. They continued to work, negotiating with producers and investors, sending Kim Jong-il a birthday letter before finally arriving in Berlin. While in Berlin, their watchdogs, watchdogs kept a close eye on them, even sharing hotel rooms with them. When the couple and their handlers crossed the border to Vienna, it was decided that only three bodyguards would accompany them, as they felt a larger group would draw too much attention. Once in the hotel in Vienna, Shin and Choi were required to give their passports over to the staff to be held overnight as required by Austrian law. Not only that, but North Korea had not booked a suite in advance, so their bodyguards would not be staying in the rooms with them. Shin and Choi saw their chance. They slipped a note to the receptionist asking for assistance getting to the U.S. Embassy. Not only that, but they managed to convince their bodyguards that if they were shadowed too closely, it really would look like they had been kidnapped. The bodyguards agreed to keep a safe distance. The next morning, Shin picked up some blank checks to make use of the estimated $2.2 million Kim had deposited in the bank account that they had previously set up. Afterwards, Shin and Choi met with a contact back at the hotel. With their handlers at a distance, they quickly got in a taxi and drove off. Their bodyguards quickly realized what was going on and flagged down a taxi to follow them. After a tense drive through the city streets, tense so we're putting it one way, Shin and Choi's taxi managed to elude the North Koreans. When they arrived at the U.S. Embassy, they practically shoved each other out of the way to get inside. They showed the staff the documents and explained the situation uh, with what English they knew. And their long nightmare was finally over. That's a movie. There must be a movie about this. Surely there's a, like, the race to the embassy is like, that is a movie scene if I've ever heard of one. Wrap up. While we'll never truly know what Kim Jong-il's reaction was to Shin and Choi's escape, it's safe to assume he wasn't very happy about it. Their names were scrubbed from the credits of Paul Gasari and the other films he directed were removed from circulation. North Korean media tried to spin their actions as those of liars and traitors, especially considering Shin stole $2 million from Kim on his way out. Oh, so he got the money as well? <laughs> Legend. Have fun. Of course, if I was locked up in a North Korean prison for two years, maybe I wouldn't feel bad about taking some money for myself either. Shin and Choi moved to Virginia in the United States, where they lived under CIA protection. They were interviewed extensively about their time in North Korea, and the agency verified the tape they had secretly used to record Kim Jong-il. They were reunited with their children, and even the kids Shin had with his mistress, Oh Su Mi, and they all came to live with them. Shin and Choi got remarried and remained together for the rest of their lives. Really, Choi? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to judge. You guys have been through a lot, but damn. Unfortunately for Shin, the Austrian government seized the money he had stolen as Kim owed money to the country. Wait, <laughs> really? That sucks. He called his money. He's like, it's my money. <laughs> and Austria's like, nah, mate, Kim, that, that country owes us country uh, money. That's kind of harsh, Austria. But Shin still longed to make movies, so he and his family moved to California for a fresh start. However, he was unknown in the West and had difficulty getting financing for his films. He still managed to direct a few movies, with his most notable work being the Three Ninjas series of Disney films. Finally, in 1999, 21 years after they were abducted, Shin and Choi returned to South Korea. At home, they found it difficult to make friends. After all, they'd publicly told the world they had defected to North Korea, and in some segments of the population, they didn't believe the story of their escape. What? You guys know how brutal North Korea is, right? You know this. You're South Korean. The audacity. In some cases, they may be correct. After all, we only have the couple's word about what happened during their time there. Oh, that's true, I suppose. But also, they ran through Vienna to get to an embassy, American embassy, to escape. At the very least, they could take solace in the fact that the country, which had been under the rule of a military dictatorship in 1978, had become wealthy, democratic, and peaceful while they were gone. Shin Sang Ok passed away on April the 11th, 2006, while Choi Yun Yun died a decade later on April the 16th, 2018. For a more detailed account of their story, I highly recommend the book A Kim Jong Il Production by Paul Fisher, as well as the documentary the lovers and the despot which also contains audio of their secret tape of kim jong-il it's a sad irony that for two people so devoted to making movies the pictures they will be most remembered for are those made against their will as for kim he continued to work on movies though he had less and less time to devote to his passions as he took control of the country from his father in the year 2000 north korea released soul's protest a historical disaster movie about a sunken ship clearly inspired by titanic as you might expect 
the movie was poorly reviewed. Kim Jong-il died on September the 17th, 2011, leaving the country in the hands of his son, Kim Jong-un, who was not yet born when the kidnapping happened. Jong-un himself made movie history when North Korea hacked Sony Pictures in 2014. <laughs> Over their satirical movie, The Interview, set in the country and starring a fictionalized version of him, Kim Jong-un understood the influence movies have have over the world just like his father indeed he did and that's where we end today's episode thank you so much for watching or listening depending how you consume this and i will see you next time